murdered in cold blood. Two schoolgirls and one of Britain's biggest ever murders. I've investigated dozens of murders. This one is different. This one hurts. Hiding in plain sight, the killer. We have an eyewitness. Ian Huntley here is a familiar figure. A man who thought he could hoodwink the police. I might be the last friendly face that these two girls had to speak to. The media. You know, somebody would have seen or heard something if somebody had tried to get those girls into a car. And the entire country. I didn't see anything untoward, nobody were hanging around. I was, unbeknown to me, talking to a murderer. Tonight, the man who put that murderer behind bars gives his only television interview since Ian Huntley went on trial. Has the perfect crime ever been committed? I doubt it. And the woman whose chance conversation sent Huntley back to cover his tracks talks on TV for the first time ever. Alarm bells rang as soon as I started talking to him. We reveal the five mistakes that caught one of Britain's most notorious killers. Can you stand there? And put him in prison for life. Huntley, by making those mistakes, convicted himself. The Fenlands of East Anglia. Peaceful, unchanging, and rarely in the news. But in the summer of 2002, they became the scene of one of Britain's most notorious crimes. I was the evening news presenter at Sky News, and I was sent to Soham to cover what turned out to be one of the biggest murder stories of the decade. It was a stifling, sweltering August, where the air didn't move and the news agenda didn't move much either. So when this story emerged of two pretty little girls going missing, just vanishing into thin air in a small, tight-knit rural community, people found the story compelling almost from the very start. August the 4th in the market town of Soham. Four minutes past five, and a photo captures the beaming smiles of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. Jessica, on the right, had come to Holly's house for a family barbecue. Both girls then went upstairs to play on a computer. Within two hours, they disappeared. The search is for two young friends, inseparable according to their parents. The two ten-year-old girls should vanish without trace is as disturbing as it is mysterious. The girls walked out of the house sometime after 6.15, without telling Holly's parents. At 6.28, CCTV captured them going across the car park of a sports centre, possibly on their way to buy sweets. Then they walked along a path towards the local high school, Soham Village College. After that, they passed College Close. At 6.33, they were seen in neighbouring College Road before vanishing. Had they been in an accident? Had they lost their way? Had they been abducted? That is what was unfolding as I headed off to Soham that August day. With every hour that passes, fears for their safety grow. Other reporters were also heading to Soham, from Britain and all over the world. As they wrote and broadcast their stories, the search parties became ever larger. A whole town, it seemed, turned out in response. But among the detectives leading the investigation, the sense of unease was growing. I helped write the world's first police manual on how to investigate murder, and I was invited by Cambridgeshire Police to advise them on this case. It was getting more and more likely that we weren't going to find these girls alive. But at the same time, you don't want to take away the hope of the parents. From a personal point of view, I found that difficult. The parents were really lovely people. This afternoon, both Holly's and Jessica's parents joined the police in making a desperate appeal for help. 
I don't allow her up the street on her own at all. At all. We don't allow her no. anywhere. No. On her own. So they both be frightened. Jessica doesn't like the dark. <clears throat> Obviously, we love them so much. We just want them to. Just everyone, anyone who's got children must know what we're going through. It was very hard not to get emotionally drawn into this story because you could see palpably, tangibly, the, the suffering that they were going through. Particularly those of us who were parents and grandparents. A couple of years before that, I had my you know, first granddaughter. I mean, I thought, God, if something happened to her, if she'd disappear, how would I feel? We've had uh, an experience friends and family searching in ditches. And in rivers, looking for shallow graves for our children. The media coverage intensified when the police released this image four days into the hunt. Those pictures of Holly and Jessica in their red Manchester United shirts were on every front page, every news bulletin. And it was an image that I think haunted the British public. Then a newspaper appealed for information leading to the girls' safe recovery. The reward? One million pounds. Shortly afterwards, David Beckham, whose name was on the back of both their shirts, made his own plea for them to return home. You're not in trouble, he said. Your parents love you, and they want you back. But 13 days after the girls went missing, the appeals came to an abrupt end. It was the news the nation had been dreading. The discovery of two bodies by a member of the public at lunchtime today in thick woodland next to the RAF base at Lake and Heath. The police had a prime suspect, Ian Huntley, the caretaker at Soham Village College. He'd given a series of interviews, claiming he'd spoken to the girls shortly before they disappeared. I just wish I asked them where they was going or anything which um, might stop all this from happening. But while he basked in the media spotlight, he also harbored a horrific secret. Huntley himself was responsible for killing Holly and Jessica. Luring them into his house, just yards from where they were last seen, then murdering them before hiding their bodies by this track 12 miles away. We had no idea that this young man had not only abducted but murdered these two little girls. Murdered them in cold blood on a Sunday afternoon when they had been doing nothing more than going to buy sweets. Later, at his Old Bailey trial, Huntley was sentenced and ordered to serve at least 40 years. But feelings were running high from the moment he was charged. There was almost a, a lynch mob mentality running through the country for a while. He became an incredible figure of hatred for the British public, and I think anything less than two full life sentences would have been seen by most people as a great injustice. But incredibly, there was a danger that justice never would be done. Despite the circumstantial evidence, the case against Huntley wasn't always open and shut. Only a series of crucial errors led to his conviction. If Huntley hadn't made those critical mistakes, then a guilty man could well have walked free. So what were the mistakes made by one of Britain's most notorious killers that ensured he would be jailed for life. Soham, the small Cambridgeshire market town was the center of international attention within days of schoolgirls Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman going missing. The world's media descended. And Ian Huntley, the man secretly responsible for the girl's disappearance, 
was about to make his first big mistake. Huntley started off not really wanting to talk to any journalists. He'd obviously talked to the police because they knew that he was the last person to see the girls alive, in his own words, that is. But he didn't really want to talk to journalists. Ian Huntley lived here, at Five College Close, just yards from Soham Village College, where he was a caretaker. He shared the house with his girlfriend, Maxine Carr. She was a teaching assistant in Holly and Jessica's class and knew both girls well. Initially, the couple were reluctant to speak to the media, but one reporter was persistent. I'm a journalist with the Press Association, and in 2002, I was the first reporter to interview Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr. He was quite emotional, he was quite upset, it seemed. Strange, he was more upset than Maxine Carr in his mannerisms, and that seemed odd, because Maxine knew them. So then I started to think, well, this is someone who must be on the police radar. And then I started thinking, we'd better photograph him, we'd better have his photograph, because if he's arrested, it might be the last chance we get. And when Huntley refused to have his photograph taken, he aroused even more suspicion. I decided that he was going to have his photograph taken, whether he liked it or not. And the picture proved to be very important in a way I didn't realise at the time. By agreeing to one interview, Huntley found he couldn't just duck out of speaking to other reporters. His problem was, that once he'd spoken to one journalist, it was difficult for him to, to say no to other journalists. Radio would come and TV would come and say, could you say to what you said to Brian on the television? It's, um, it's just very upsetting, you know? And to think that I might be the last friendly face that these two girls had to speak to. Eventually, he agreed to this interview with a regional TV news program, but laid down an unusual condition. I don't want any of the, uh, the national press to, um, to have hold of this interview. I'm doing this just for local television, as I believe um, the children are still local and um, it's only relevant really to the local areas. It's not going to be in the, uh, the national interest um, to hear what I've got to say, really. Despite this early caution, Huntley then developed a taste for the spotlight. Well, we have an eyewitness. Ian Huntley here is a familiar figure. Evening, Ian. I asked him if he'd do an interview with Sky, a national 24-hour news network, and he agreed. How did this seem to you? It seemed fine, very cheerful, happy, chatty. I didn't see anything untoward, nobody were hanging around. You know, just seemed like normal, happy kids. I was, unbeknown to me, talking to a murderer, looking into the eyes of a man who killed two little girls. While there's no news, then there's still that glimmer of hope, and that's basically all we're all hanging on to. I felt, straight off the bat when I saw him, that this man knew more than what he was saying, and that he wasn't being cooperative. He was, in fact, being devious, and practicing, perhaps, for a later question. And there was nothing that Sunday evening that gave you a glimmer of suspicion that anything was wrong? No, not at all. In the end, that was probably the beginning of his undoing. The fact he couldn't resist being part of the story. The saying is, you know, while there's no news, then there's still that glimmer of hope. Hope, hope, hope. It soon became clear why Huntley had initially tried to stay out of the public eye. When interviews like this were broadcast nationwide, people in his hometown recognised a familiar face. I'm the crime reporter on the Grimsby Telegraph, and in 2002, we realised that the story in Soham had a Grimsby link. We started getting calls in the newsroom that the man who'd appeared on television was Ian Huntley. The callers were telling us about his previous record of allegations of rape and underage sex with girls. We found in our archives the front page story about an allegation of rape against a woman in an area of central Grimsby known as Gas Alley. The man was Ian Huntley. 
we immediately contacted Humberside Police. Although the rape charge was dropped in 1998, the police also received complaints about sex offences allegedly carried out by Huntley on eight other women and girls. But none of these led to a trial in court, so he had no criminal record. And Huntley wasn't the only one talking to the press. Nobody believes that they would ever run away. Um, they was very close to all their family. Just as Huntley was arousing suspicion by giving interviews, so was his girlfriend. This is something I'll probably keep for the rest of my life, I think. Um, it's what Holly gave me on the last day of term. She gave me this with a poem on the inside, mm -hmm. saying um, to a special teaching assistant, really, and we'll, we'll miss her a lot and we'll see her in the future. And that's the kind of girl she was. She was just lovely, really lovely. That's the sort of girl she was. Both my producers said that was odd, wasn't it? She seemed to be speaking in the past tense. She was saying was, like the girls weren't around anymore. And that's the kind of girl she was. Was, 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 was. And we both thought, yeah, that is odd. That is odd. We should mention that to the police. It's now the biggest investigation into missing children the force here has ever undertaken. As the police poured resources into the inquiry, it became clear they'd made errors of their own. By launching a nationwide appeal, and by using the photo of Holly and Jessica in their football shirts, they stoked massive public interest. And a televised reconstruction created even more. Two child actresses retraced the last known movements of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. The police incident room was overwhelmed. It was receiving more than a thousand calls a day. With officers struggling to cope, a new man was put in charge. Twelve days after the girls disappeared, I was appointed senior investigating officer. I think it's easy to look back with hindsight and, and see that by using the media to publicise the disappearance of these two girls, and to uh, spread it almost worldwide was a mistake. Uh, and one of the first things that I did when I took over was to refocus the investigation into the immediate locality. It's a standard procedure to, uh, a phrase we always use, clear the ground under your feet. And I didn't feel that that had been done. Key to this new approach was a review of the girls' last known movements and the whereabouts of Jessica's mobile phone, which had disappeared. Jessica rings us and says, can I go to the sweet shop with Holly? And when officers started looking at what happened to Jessica's phone, Ian Huntley's second mistake began to emerge. The police discovered that Jessica's mobile had been switched off in the early evening shortly after the girls were last seen alive on CCTV. Whoever had done it was probably responsible for their disappearance. I was asked by Cambridgeshire Police to examine the call records of Jessica's phone, in particular where the phone might have been when it was turned off at 6.46 that evening. Whenever a mobile is switched off, it sends what's known as a goodbye signal to a transmission mast. Based on Holly and Jessica's last known route, the police expected that signal to be picked up here, the Sower Mast situated at the local football club. If it had, then the Sower cell site covers quite a large area and we wouldn't have known where to start looking. But Jessica's phone did not send its goodbye signal to the Sower Mast. Up here, it sent it to the Burwell Mast which is some five miles south. Only a handful of locations in Soham could receive and transmit signals from the more remote Burwell mast. And one of them was right on the route of Holly and Jessica's last walk. There was one place where the phone on that route might have been served by the Burwell cell site was past the college, right outside the caretaker's house. That meant that when Jessica's phone was powered down, it must have been either outside or in the vicinity of Ian Huntley's house. 
Suddenly, the net was closing in on the SOA murderer. The intelligence that we received on that Friday uh, with re regard to Jessica's mobile phone led to a complete refocus of the investigation. This was a significant uh, moment. I felt at that time a sense of relief that we were definitely on the right track. I knew that we'd got the right man. Thirteen days into the search for missing Soham schoolgirls, Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells, the police were homing in on a suspect, local school caretaker Ian Huntley. His TV interviews had alerted them to his possible links with sexual assaults in his hometown of Grimsby. And mobile phone analysis showed at least one of the girls had been at, or near, his house at the time of their disappearance. Look at your neighbours, think about your neighbours, uh, who's to the left of you, who's to the right, and think of any strange behaviour or anything like that. Um, and I think it's a very good idea. As Huntley portrayed himself as a man helping the police inquiry, he was under investigation himself. Detectives also questioned his girlfriend, Maxine Carr, about his movements on the day the two ten-year-olds went missing. And this is when a third crucial mistake was made. Not by Huntley, but by his girlfriend. Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr first met and started living together in their hometown of Grimsby. They later moved south to Soham in Cambridgeshire, where he got his caretaker's job. And she worked in Holly and Jessica's primary school as a teaching assistant in their class. Right. Times right. what they said. Um, did, they, did they actually ask for me? When Carr was asked where she and Huntley were on the day of Holly and Jessica's disappearance, she was clear. They were together at home at Five College Close, so on. What about what was wrong with you? And is that a normal thing that he would do after dinner on a Sunday? It is when I want him out of the way. Did you want him Carr went into intricate detail even down to what she'd cooked for Sunday lunch. Carr said she'd been with Huntley all day and nothing unusual had happened. He had someone backing up his story, but she was lying. It was a big mistake on her part because we always check these things. We can check the phone records. And that's just what the police did. They discovered that Huntley's phone had received several calls from Carr's mobile. Calls made from a hundred miles away. She hadn't been with him in Soham on the day in question. She'd been visiting her mother in Cromwell Road, Grimsby. She was trying to be clever. She was trying to manipulate the inquiry. But she wasn't very clever at doing it. And also it put a lot more suspicion on Huntley as well. Because why would she lie? And we were inevitably going to check it, as we always do. And it was while checking the content of the texts that detectives made another alarming discovery. Maxine Carr told Ian that she was going out to a party. Of course, he was on his own at home without any female company, and he wasn't happy about that. And there's no doubt they had words on that Sunday afternoon, and, and that did nothing to uh, improve his his demeanour and, and his temper. And I think that that played a, an integral part in the motivation uh, for what he did to Holly and Jessica. But what had he done to them inside the house? At this point, the police still had no idea. And arresting Huntley would have posed a huge risk. There was a possibility that Ian Huntley had abducted these two girls and they were alive. I was concerned that if I went out and arranged for Huntley to be arrested immediately and he spent three or four days in custody, uh, those girls could die because he wasn't there to feed them. Instead, the police decided to invite Huntley in for voluntary questioning. Very slim. That's what's so thin. Huntley lied from the start of his interview. 
but the pressure was beginning to tell. Especially when officers asked him to describe what Holly was like when he saw her on the day she disappeared. He stayed silent for an astonishing 55 seconds. Uh, it was a, a good piece of interviewing. A lot of interviewing officers would have said something during that uh, almost a minute, but they didn't, and uh, uh, it became very significant. I just felt that this was the man that we needed to focus on. Uh, he was a, a clearly um, lying, and he was clearly finding that interview uh, uncomfortable when he was asked to uh, describe uh, what the girls looked like. Uh, he was reliving his last vision of the girls, and he didn't like what he saw. By now, police had no other suspects, but they also lacked proof of Huntley's involvement in Holly and Jessica's disappearance. Later that evening, he was released, along with Carr, who had also been questioned. We were in a quandary. We had an enormous amount of circumstantial evidence which pointed to both their involvement, but we didn't have forensic evidence. We didn't have the bodies, so we didn't even know it was a murder investigation at this time. But the police's frustration in their investigation of Ian Huntley would soon come to an end as a result of Huntley's fourth critical error. Ever since the girls' disappearance, police had been combing every inch of Soham, trying to find them, dead or alive. Among the first places they searched was the village high school, where Huntley was caretaker. But with the inquiries stalled, the lead detective ordered his officers to search it again. I decided that the searches that were done initially weren't thorough enough, and in fact, Huntley had been present on some of the searches and may well have directed search teams away from relevant areas. So I decided that we would go back and search the whole of the school premises again. It was a massive undertaking and it led to a phone call to me very late about 11.30 p.m. from the search commander to tell me that there had been a significant find at Soham and that the girls' clothing had been found in a bin, concealed in the building to which Hunley had access. When police found the partially burnt clothes, they knew the girls must now be dead. was that terrible, grim, heavy feeling that gets in your soul and in your mind that first time we actually knew that the police thought they were dead. I shall uh, never forget the moment that I received the phone call that they had found the girls' clothing. And it was in such a condition that, really, there was no hope of finding the girls alive. Quite clearly, that was a huge watershed moment. And I can remember uh, the impact that it had. The football shirts that had appeared in every newspaper and on every TV bulletin had been placed at the bottom of a bin. As this police computer simulation shows, someone had put a black plastic liner on top to conceal them. Tests had to be carried out to determine who that person was, but detectives were sure they already knew. Huntley obviously felt happy that he could conceal the clothing there and it would never be found because we wouldn't go back and look again. That turned out to be a big mistake. In the last few hours, a 28-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman have been arrested. Huntley and Carr were taken into custody on suspicion of murder as soon as the clothes were discovered. 
Whilst there, Carr dramatically changed her story, finally admitting where she really was on the day of the schoolgirl's disappearance. I was in Salem on the focus. It's August. I came back to Salem on the Tuesday. I was actually in Grimsby. Carr claimed she'd been simply trying to protect Huntley from being arrested. He'd previously spent time on remand for rape, and she said he couldn't cope with life in a cell. She was put in a prison, and he had a nervous breakdown and everything else. The investigation was gathering pace. The search for the girls now becomes a search for the bodies. And just a few hours later, it moved into a whole new phase. The discovery of two bodies by a member of the public at lunchtime today in thick woodland next to the RAF base at Lake and Heath. It was just a, a desperately dark and horrible day to be reporting, really. I felt very sad. We felt as though we knew the girls. We were devastated. In 2002, I was a police officer who was in charge of the site where Holly and Jessica's bodies were found. I walked up this uh, track into the woodland and uh, I looked into the ditch. I couldn't say that they were Holly and Jessica. They had been in that ditch probably for nearly two weeks at that stage, so it was impossible to tell who was who. Out of an evening mist which had fallen on a remote patch of Suffolk woodland, the bodies of Holly and Jessica were taken away. When I first visited the mortuary on that Sunday night, and it really came home to me then, the enormity of uh, what had happened. I was very keen that the um, families did not see the two girls uh, in this decomposed state. I didn't want them to look at the scenes that I'd been looking at over, the, over that day. The police were unable to recover any forensic evidence from this site linking Huntley to the bodies. But they still had the shirts found in one of the buildings where he worked. They'd asked scientists to examine the bin liner which had been placed over them, and the results were in. They said Huntley's fingerprint is on the actual bin liner, on top of the clothes, in the bin, and in such a position that only the person putting that bin liner in that bin would have touched it. Using computer graphics, experts were later able to demonstrate just how hard Huntley had tried to hide the clothes. Huntley tried to say that, as a caretaker, I handle bin bags every day. Uh, of course my fingerprints will be on the bin bags. But the, the method that we used to display where these uh, fingerprints were uh, clearly indicated that he had put his hands inside the bag and had uh, opened out the bag um, from the inside to conceal the clothes underneath. And that was not the day-to-day -day handling of a, a bin bag uh, as his duties as a caretaker. They were the actions of a person who wanted to conceal what was underneath. The forensic scientists then found fibres from the shirts in Huntley's house and even on one of the boots he was wearing when he was arrested. We were elated. We knew at that point that we had our man. And that man was Huntley and he was going to be charged with the crime of murder. But the police still had to convince a jury to find their suspect guilty. And Huntley's final mistake helped them to do just that. August the 17th, 2002. 13 days after Holly and Jessica disappeared, Ian Huntley was back in police custody this time under arrest for suspicion of murder. But after giving so many media interviews during the search, he was now silent. Do you understand that? Can I just ask you, do you wish to be interviewed on tape now about these men? No. He was unable to speak 
which we found quite unusual and quite disturbing, bearing in mind only a few hours before he'd been speaking quite coherently throughout an interview. By now, police had recovered Holly and Jessica's football shirts, concealed in a bin at the school where Huntley was caretaker. But how could they link him to the bodies which had been discovered hidden in a ditch 12 miles away? Yet again, Huntley, unwittingly, gave them their breakthrough. After his first press interview, Huntley was pictured getting into his aging Ford Fiesta, the car he used to take the girls' bodies away. To the reporter who'd just spoken to him, it looked like a routine photo. What I didn't see was what the police saw. They didn't look at Ian Huntley's face. What the detectives noticed was new tires on an old car. And the question they asked them was, why would a school caretaker be buying four new tires at a time? Detectives discovered he bought the tires here the day after the girls were murdered. He'd paid a fitter £10 to put a false registration on the invoice. I knew the significance of that. I knew the impact that that would have on a jury. Fears that forensic evidence might unmask Huntley were clearly playing on his mind. A conversation he'd had with a policewoman, who has never spoken on TV before, explains all. In 2002, I was a special constable for Cambridgeshire Constabulary. I was put on duty at the college and I was approached by a man who I now know to be Ian Huntley. Alarm bells rang as soon as I started talking to him because he was just a very strange person, full stop. Every time he referred to the girls, it was always past tense. It was never in the present. He then just suddenly went on to blurt out, how long does DNA evidence last for? My comment was, it lasts forever. They've used it on woolly mammoths and they've used it on the Russian Tsar family. And I thought, that's strange, very strange. Why would somebody just say that? That is not what a normal member of the public says to somebody who's sat in uniform in front of them. Police believe that after this conversation, Huntley was so worried about lingering DNA that within hours, he'd driven back to the ditch where he'd hidden Holly and Jessica's bodies. He cut off their clothing and tried to burn off any remaining forensic evidence on the bodies with petrol. He thought he was in the clear that there was no other way to link his car to this track. But he was wrong. I'm a forensic geologist. After the murders, the police asked me to examine Huntley's car to see if there might be any evidence that would link it to the track where the bodies were discovered. To do that, the first thing I did was look at the car itself. And it was fairly obvious immediately that there was a, an extensive deposit of soil and rocky material on the suspension arm on the front left wheel. It had quite a lot of pieces of chalk in it. The next thing I did was go to the track where the bodies had been hidden. The farmer who owned this track had recently resurfaced it. One of the materials he'd used was chalk. What's great about chalk is it contains thousands upon thousands of very, very tiny fossils, what we call, unsurprisingly, microfossils. And you can uh, send them off and have them dated according to the fossils that you find in them. These two types of chalk, the one from the car, the one from the track, were identical. On August the 20th, 16 days after Holly and Jessica's disappearance, Huntley was charged with their murders. Officers broke the news to his fiancée, Maxine Carr, who was also in custody. But was Carr as ignorant of his crimes as she claimed? I think Carr was undoubtedly responsible for uh, quite a lot of that, in spite of the story that she was telling to police. 
Although the jury accepted her account that she didn't know Huntley had killed the girls, others are not so sure. I believe Maxine Carr to be as equally evil uh, as Huntley. And I say that because there's no doubt in my mind that she knew what had happened. She could have taken the opportunity to come forward, told us what she knew, but she didn't. And I think she's as evil and as calculating as Huntley himself. Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr were brought to the Old Bailey in separate vans. In December 2003, Carr was jailed for three and a half years for conspiring to pervert the course of justice. Because of her time on remand, she served less than six months and now lives under an assumed name. Huntley, after initially denying everything, dramatically changed his story. Yes, the girls were in the caretaker's house. Yes, Ian Huntley was there when they died. He told the court that both girls had died accidentally and pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter. But the prosecution still pressed for a murder conviction. After four agonizing days of deliberation, the jury returned its verdict. Guilty of murdering Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. The same caretaker is sentenced to life in prison for both murders. I was so pleased for the parents that we got the right person, the right verdict had come in. And that's the time to reflect on what really happened here and the horror um, of the last moments of these two girls. And there's something there that always stays with you. And, and on this particular one, um, it, it does, on occasions, come back. Um, but I am proud of the job that we did and its conclusion, and Huntley still remains behind bars, which is, which is the correct thing. Yeah, it, it does grab me sometimes. It does come back. Huntley was convicted, but only by a majority verdict. And would it have been different if he hadn't made his series of mistakes. If he hadn't used his car to dispose of the bodies. If he hadn't gone back to cut off their shirts and conceal them in the school bin. If Jessica's phone hadn't been turned off right outside his house. And if he'd been able to resist speaking to the media. If he hadn't made those mistakes, we would have struggled, in my view, to gain a conviction. Huntley, by making those mistakes, convicted himself. Has the perfect crime ever been committed? I doubt it. I think um, we would have got him convicted. I think that we would have stood a good chance. But without those shirts, it would have been a, a much weaker case. Had he not returned and collected the clothing and taken it back to the college, then we might not be sat here today talking about him being convicted for the murder of two children. It may have been a, a, a manslaughter verdict instead of murder uh, and a much shorter sentence, and, and Huntley would have been out now instead of facing a minimum of 40 years imprisonment, which will take him nearly to his 70th birthday. That's a long time. Huntley is only 45 and only 15 years into his sentence. In 2004, number five College Close was demolished and the rubble taken away to deter ghoulish souvenir hunters. Today, just an empty tract of grassland remains. But the events of 2002 will never be erased from the town of Soham and neither will the memories of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. <laughs>